Greetings. In this video, I would like to talk about the relationship between the state and male bachelors, i.e. Uh, MGTOW, and go on their own way, <clears throat> as well as several political issues. Before I proceed, I would first like to thank my subscriber, Dogboy97, who had prompted me to investigate the issue further. Now, in my previous video on herbivore men in Japan, I talked about the possible state enacted measures that could be implemented to punish men from defecting from traditional relationships in an effort to curb their behavior, and that these measures would most likely be in the form of a supplemental tax on bachelors. Unfortunately, this is nothing new, and we can look back to the past 2,000 years of recorded history as evidence for this. There has always been an active state and social hostility to MGTOW because bachelors did not usually propagate their DNA, read worker drones for exploitation by the state, and were difficult to control. The state and government has always been about control, control of choices, control of desires, and this is no different. The state also has a vested interest in gathering revenue since it produces nothing by itself from its citizens, read dependents. With these things having been said, it should come as little surprise that such a thing as the bachelor tax has existed and been implemented to limit male autonomy and to confiscate wealth that was not seen as beneficial to state power and to punish defection from expected societal norms. In the passages below, I will read off some of the historically attestable measures taken in Rome to punish marriage defection, written by the Roman historian Livy. 120. Speech of the censor, men must marry Rome, 131 BC. The speech of the censor, uh, Quintus Caecilius Metellus Macedon Macedonicus, about the law requiring men to marry in order to produce children. According to Livy, in 17 BC, Augustus read out this speech, which seemed, quote unquote, written for the hour, in the Senate in support of his own legislation encouraging marriage and childbearing. Quote, if we could survive without a wife, citizens of Rome, all of us would do without that nuisance. But since nature has so decreed that we cannot manage comfortably with them, nor live in any way without them, we must plan for our lasting preservation rather than for our temporary pleasure. Quote. 121. Prizes for marriage and having children. Augustus assessed heavier taxes on unmarried men and women without husbands, and by contrast offered awards for marriage and childbearing. And since there were more males than females among the nobility, he permitted anyone who wished except for senators to marry freed women and decree that children of such marriages be legitimate. Not only do we see the sycophancy of the male towards the female, citing male dependence on the female for preservation, meaning procreation, but we see even that 2,000 years ago, the state had a heavy hand in marriage and regulating reproduction. These were early forms of the bachelor tax. Quote, a favorite strategy of governments is to encourage population growth and raise money at the same time. Julius Caesar tried it in 18 BC. The English imposed it in 1695. The Russians under Peter the Great used it in 1702, as did the Missouri legislature in 1820. The Spartans of ancient Greece didn't care about the money. They preferred public humiliation. Bachelors, read MGTOW, in Sparta were required to march around the public market in wintertime stark naked while singing a song making fun of their unmarried status. Quote. This is further evidence to suggest how hostile society is to men who reject convention tradition, and it continued in colonial America. Quote, Life in colonial America was difficult, Families and communities depended on each other for survival. The challenge of forming new towns, farming the land, and learning basic survival skills were often more than the colonists could handle. Communities desired marriages as soon as young people were of age so they could make their own way and be less of a burden to families. The more children they produced, the more free workers reached state. They had to help on the farms and go into trade. Men, were un men who were unattached from the responsibility of caring for a wife and family were thought to be too easily enticed into mischief. They were less likely to be significant contributors to society and the economy. Therefore, a tax on bachelorhood was established in several colonial communities to help entice young men into marriage. In addition to the bachelor tax, unmarried men were treated with other inequalities to induce them to marry. Laws were created to limit their freedom. 
positive incentives were also established to encourage matrimony. For example, in Connecticut, bachelors were not permitted to have their own homes. In Salem, North Carolina, single men couldn't own land or a home. They were required to live at their single brother's house until they married. Quote. <clears throat> and finally, in modern society, the trend continues unabated, as we can see from this passage uh, taken from Irish, uh, Irish tax law. For tax purposes, both partners continue to be treated as two single persons in the year of marriage or the year of civil partnership was registered. However, if the tax you pay as two single persons is that in that year is greater than the tax you would, you would be payable if you had been taxed as a couple in a marriage or civil partnership, a refund of the difference can be claimed. Any refund is due only from the date of marriage or registra registrations of civil partnership and will be calculated at the end of that tax year. Favoritism, anyone? It goes without saying that one of the first forms of affirmative action was for the married couple because it was perceived as beneficial to society and it benefited the state and that it produced workers to feed his need for control and exploitation. The state has always been involved in the marriage business and has always disapproved of or punished single men who chose not to buy into the system, and such men have been around forever. Thus, it is very difficult to support the idea of marriage whilst at the same time being opposed to state force and coercion, since historically they are closely linked to each other. Marriage affirmative action is also the source of many modern problems independent of bachelorhood. Take the gay marriage issue, for example. Now, I differ from many of my counterparts in that I have no issues whatsoever with gay people, perceiving it to be neither wrong nor unethical or immoral. However, with that said, the source of the squabbling over gay marriage can be found in the state-issued benefits that married couples receive, meaning that the argument is one that stems from envy, which state favoritism and affirmative action always create, and which is why the state should not be involved in any of this at all creates unnecessarily public division when doing so, when none is required. Moving on. We can clearly see why men going their own way, MGTOW, is the object of so much hostility from people with more traditionalist mindsets. But this hostility is nothing new under the sun. It has always been there. At best, MGTOW is seen as a poor and pseudo-necessary alternative to traditional relationships, and at worst, it is likened to the worst of political ideology, cited as anti-family and a host of other things. I think the Roman dictators thought similar such things. The men buying into the system and relinquishing their freedom for the sake of a society that does not care about them has always been an integral part of male identity. And most males follow this pattern, most modern males follow this pattern reflexively as well. But what differs now is that with the advent of modern communication, men not buying into the system can find others of like mind and thus create, a, create new paths of communication as well as alliances that were previously impossible. This free exchange of information is typified by and allows us to find out things about such things such as bachelor tax, briefos law, and eventually allows us to understand what a man's place is in this world and is not a pleasant one, which is the point of men's rights. Misandry. Misandry is ingrained in the human psyche, both in the female and her contempt for male personhood, and the male's own contempt for himself, as well as his inclination to abase himself in front of the female. And this indicates, indicates just what an uphill struggle it is to advocate for individual male sovereignty, as both females and other males will oppose it. A point regarding individual male sovereignty is the deep misperception that it's anti-family rather than pro-male. And I think this is the source of much of the conflict we have experienced in recent months. Men's rights originally began as an outpouring of fathers' rights, as politicized feminism took hold of the courts and other government institutions and co-opted it in complete favor of the female. This origin can be understood and appreciated in its proper context. But the simple fact is that men's rights has moved beyond the sole concern of fathers' rights, whilst maintaining that it is certainly one of those concerns, to a more general concern of men's rights wherein each man is seen as an individual with a right to live as he chooses without being punished either socially, for example in the form of shaming language that we hear from both feminists and traditionalists, or in the form of government coercion and force such as the bachelor tax or military prescription, which, also, which is often a death sentence. 
This does not make MGTOW or the MRI anti-family. It merely means that both have evolved and diversified beyond that being their sole concern, as evidenced by the very clear and apparent societal and biological hostility towards men who do not toe the line. These expanded concerns are very valid indeed and necessary, because it is very clear that if individual men do not look after themselves, no one else will. At the same time, not a single man going his own way has ever advocated for the abrogation of female rights or imposing limitations to things they might want to do, nor have men going their own way ever advocated for wealth confiscation through government force, what feminists have done, as well as traditionalists who support the notion of a bachelor tax because it is, quote, good for society, end quote. So sadif, same as the feminists, is just a newish shaming tactic, little different to others, and pretty unoriginal at that. Men are free to have families, and I have nothing against that, more than I have anything against golf or fishing. But I also have no primary interest in these things. Lack of interest is not opposition or hostility, and complaining these things seems almost like a deliberate desire to misunderstand. Now, for the record, I would like to cite a comment made on one of my videos in reference to the idea of fixing family law, and I quote, There is much in this video I would like to comment on, but for now let's limit it to father's rights. As someone who came to the MRM through dad's rights, fought the good fight, and lost anyway, I feel strongly that working with courts to augment and enforce dad's rights is the wrong approach. Instead, we would do better to encourage men to and absolve men of turning their backs on their offspring. This is a man who, by his own admission and experience, recognized the futility of changing such an entrenched system of laws and misandry. If this is a man who had fought the good fight and lost, and subsequently had come to the conclusion that it is better to let men just move on, even if it is at the cost of the loss of their offspring, this is the evidence that all men, but especially men going their own way, need to bear in mind. If something is broken on such an incredible level, it cannot be fixed by conventional means. And this is a further reason why men's rights has moved beyond the sole concern of fatherhood to a more general concern for the welfare of men. The historical evidence is all there to be seen, namely that the state and its lackeys have always had a vested interest in punishing men who choose their own path. And just because there is a perception that certain aspects of state coercion might be beneficial to society, if our primary concern is the individual, then that argument is invalid. For this reason, it is important we remain on guard against what I term selective anti-statism which can be seen in both the right and the left aisles. <clears throat> From the left, we often hear about rights, quote, end quote, quote, end quote, such as the right to education, a right to contraception, and so on. And whilst ignoring all these rights can only be come from and derived from the left, from the theft of wealth uh, of the individual who likely does not endorse these so-called rights, wealth confiscation. But the right is no different. Instead of rights, we often hear the terms duty and obligation bandied about, specifically with reference to duty to the nation. This is why it's so incredibly rare to hear right-wing opposition to war, because war and the men serving in war as cannon fodder are part of that obligation to the state. Remember that the the right openly disparaged Vietnam War protests whilst thousands of men were being maimed, killed, and sent back in body bags, many forced against their wills and sent to their deaths. Those survivors who came back were treated as human trash, unpatriotic, homeless, and unworthy of the nation they were most coincidentally born in. Ultimately, both the right and the left are two sides of the same coin. The left wishes for individual rights for the masses at the cost of individual rights on the individual scale. The right wishes that individual rights be suppressed for the greater whole, i.e. war, prescriptions against whatever they might view as deviant behavior, and so on. Libertarianism, if viewed in its simplest form as a principle of non-coercion, cannot be allied with either, since both the left and the right wish to make use of the state to coerce behavior in individuals, albeit often for different reasons. This is also the reason why I cannot see the quote-unquote defeating the left slogan as a part of the solution, because I think both the right and the left are part of the problem, since both support very different manifestations of uh, state violence against the individual. 
In closing, we have seen just how strong the opposition to men going their own way is for various reasons. Because it's not perceived as beneficial to society or natural principles, read the state, and that pushing for the right-left paradigm exacerbates the problem and does, not, does nothing to solve it. Since both the right and the left are operate, operating in the, along the lines of in-group, out-group thinking, whilst ignoring the individual as an abstraction and as something real, all the while endorsing state violence against the individual. We cannot go along this path. This is why we have to move beyond the left and the right into the realm of men's rights, and men as individuals with only as many duties and obligations as they see fit to have. Thanks for watching.